All right. So, uh, so we're going to have four great speakers, young faculty members who are physician scientists who are part of our K-12 Scholars Program, which is an NIH-funded scholars program for physician scientists. Um, so we're going to start off. They only have five minutes, and I can promise you I've heard all of these talks before. They can talk for two hours, each of them, okay? But they're going to give you a real condensed version, so pay close attention. So the first one is Allison Chu, who's an assistant professor in neonatology. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, so today I'll be talking about epithelial membrane protein 2, or EMP2, and how EMP2 deficiency alters placental angiogenesis. So to give you a little bit of background, the reason that I'm, uh, we're interested in this is because placental insufficiency is a condition that affects up to 10% of pregnancies. Um, it can lead to human conditions like recurrent miscarriage or preterm delivery or intrauterine growth restriction. So it's important to understand how placental insufficiency occurs. So early in placental development, um, blood vessels have to form, so the maternal blood vessels have to dilate. And the way that that happens is that fetal extravillus trophoblasts invade into the maternal decidua and interact with resident cells such as natural killer cells. And there's several signals that uh, and communication that happens here that leads to normal maternal blood vessel dilation such that the mom can provide nutrients and oxygen to the baby. When there's problems in this process, then obviously the baby does not get good nutrients and oxygen, and that can lead to any of those conditions as aforementioned. So there isn't a lot actually that's known about placental insufficiency as it's likely multifactorial, but we do know that signals such as hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha or VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor are important in this interaction. And in this study, what I'm gonna present is the role of a novel protein, so epithelial membrane protein 2. So why are we interested in EMP2? So it's a transmembrane protein that modulates cell surface expression of MHC class 1 molecules, integrins, caviolins. It's largely been studied in cancer models, um, and we do know that it does play a role in reproduction. So in endometrial cell lines, EMP2 expression does regulate angiogenesis via alterations of HIF1-alpha and VEGF, and this is consistent also in cancer cells. In the mouse, we know that EMP2 is expressed on the uterine epithelial cell surface, as well as trophoectoderm cells in the implanting embryo. And we know that knockdown of EMP2 does result in impaired implantation in vivo. So given that EMP2 is important in cancer cells, and I talked a little bit about how those trophoblast cells have cancer-like properties, those invading properties, we thought that EMP2 may be important in placentation. So our objectives were to first look at a murine model of EMP2 knockout to understand how EMP2 may play a role in altered placental vascularization, and then secondly, to see whether EMP2 is important in the human placenta. So first, what I want to show you is that um, this is a wild-type mouse placenta throughout gestation. So here is at E6.5 all the way through to late gestation, so E16.5. And, and EMP2 is expressed throughout the um, gestation in the placenta, both within the embryo and the maternal decidual aspects as the placenta um, matures to its uh, final form, where here the labyrinth, which is the main exchange area, um, the cytotrophoblasts here in this exchange area do express EMP2, and the other population that has um, strong expression is these giant trophoblast cells that are in the junctional zone of the mouse placenta. So when we looked at our EMP2 knockout model, what we saw was a very mild uh, reproductive phenotype of placental insufficiency. So I didn't show the data here, but there is a reduction in litter size, though pup weight was not affected. So then we went to look at the placentas to see if they looked similar to human placental insufficiency. So what I'm showing you here is that, in fact, our EMP2 knockout placentas do demonstrate hypovascularity. So if you look at these positively stained linear um, structures, those are the blood vessels forming, and this is at E9 and a half. You can see that when you look at our knockout, there's less um, blood vessels formed here. And when we quantify that by different stains for endothelial cells, that holds true. Um, then another thing that we saw, actually to back up, is that also there's increased fibrin deposition in these EMP2 knockout placentas, and both of these findings have been reported in human placentas in IUGR and placental insufficiency. So 
We wanted to know what the mechanism was here and whether or not HIF1-alpha and VEGF may be important. And so the first thing we did was stain for HIF1-alpha. What we found was unexpected. So when we look at um, cancer models and when we looked at our um, in vitro data using trophoblast cell lines, we actually see that EMP2 expression knocks down also HIF1-alpha expression as well as VEGF expression or specific isoforms of VEGF. But in our in vivo model, what we see is that in our EMP2 knockout, there's actually increased HIF1-alpha expression. And when we look at exactly what these um, uh, what cells are expressing this HIF1-alpha, it's interesting. So when we quantify when HIF1-alpha expression is increased, it's important early in gestation, which we would expect because that's when placental angiogenesis is occurring. Um, and we found that the cells that are expressing this HIF1-alpha are actually those uterine NK cells that are important in that early blood vessel development. Um, and so based on all of this data, we wanted to look in the human placenta and see if EMP2 expression was affected. And in fact, when you look at IUGR sections compared to normal pregnancies, um, you have a decrease of EMP2 expression in trophoblast cell populations, both within the villi and the interstitium. And by blotting, you do see a reduction in EMP2 expression in, IUG in human IUGR. So we conclude that EMP2 does have an important role in placentation and may be important in early placental angiogenesis, and future studies are um, planned to look at how the mechanisms of how that may occur. And so thank you on that note, especially to my um, mentors and to the CDI and everybody in the lab who helped. Thanks, Allison. I forgot to mention that Dr. Devasker is Allison's mentor. Uh, the next one is Mark Hanadel. Mark, you want to come up? Um, so Mark is a clinical instructor in the Division of Pediatric Nephrology. He'll be an assistant professor in July. And his mentors are Isidro Saluski, who's in nephrology, and also Tom Gantz. Hi. So... I'm Mark Anudel from the Division of Pediatric Nephrology, and our research focuses on the interaction between a hormone called fibroblast growth factor 23 and iron deficiency anemia in chronic kidney disease. So first, some background regarding why the study of this hormone in chronic kidney disease is important. In pediatric CKD patients, the leading cause of death is cardiovascular disease. And traditional cardiovascular risk factors, such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, cannot fully explain the high rates of cardiovascular mortality observed in this population. Other factors are definitely contributory, including abnormalities in a recently discovered hormone called FGF23. So FGF23 is a hormone secreted by bone that regulates phosphate. FGF23 physiologically functions to lower phosphate levels by inducing phosphaturia and by lowering active vitamin D levels. This graph shows percentages of pediatric CKD patients with high FGF23 levels, shown in blue, and hyperphosphatemia, shown in green. So as you can see, FGF23 levels increase very early in the CKD course and further increase as GFR declines. These higher FGF23 levels help to maintain normal phosphatemia until very late in the CKD course. However, this beneficial effect of FGF23 is outweighed by its adverse off-target effects. In CKD patients, higher FGF23 levels are independently associated with cardiovascular mortality. More specifically, higher FGF23 levels in CKD are associated with increased left ventricular mass index, as shown in the upper right-hand corner. And in animal studies, shown at the bottom, FGF23 administration directly causes left ventricular hypertrophy, demonstrating the pathologic cardiovascular effects of FGF23 in chronic kidney disease. So although FGF23 is a hormone produced by bone and regulated by mineral metabolism parameters like phosphate, vitamin D, PTH, interestingly, iron may represent a novel determinant of FGF23 production. So to test the hypothesis that iron may affect FGF23, we placed wild-type mice on diets that did or did not contain adenine 
which induces chronic kidney disease, that also contain various iron concentrations. 4 ppm to iron deplete the mice, standard 335 ppm, or 10,000 ppm to iron load the mice. The diets begin at four weeks of age, and the mice were euthanized eight weeks later, at which time we measured various biochemical parameters. This slide shows some of our outcome measures. Control mice are on the left half of each graph, and CKD mice are on the right. Blue represents the low iron diet, green the standard iron diet, and red the high iron diet. As expected, the mice on the adenine-containing diets developed high urea nitrogen concentrations. For unclear reasons, the CKD high iron group had the highest BUN. Liver iron concentration, which is a measure of total body iron stores, increased as dietary iron concentration increased. And regarding FGF23 parameters, among the control mice, the low iron group had dramatically increased bone FGF23 mRNA expression and circulating FGF23 levels. And in the CKD group, iron deficiency was also associated with the highest levels of bone FGF23 mRNA expression and the highest circulating FGF23 levels. And the CKD high iron group, despite having the worst kidney function, had the lowest FGF23 levels. Demonstrating the effects of iron status on FGF23 production in the CKD mouse model. Now, to further associate phos uh, investigate phosphate independent associations between iron and FGF23, we performed multiple regression modeling in the CKD cohort. Iron and phosphate were independent variables, and FGF23 was the dependent variable. Independent of serum phosphate levels, we observed an inverse association between liver iron concentration and FGF23, suggesting a CKD model in which iron deficiency is associated with increased FGF23 production. Lastly, and interestingly, iron status may not be the only hematologic factor associated with increased FGF23 production. In work we just recently completed, the administration of erythropoietin also acutely increases bone FGF23 mRNA expression in circulating levels in wild-type mice, suggesting further intriguing associations between hematologic factors and disordered mineral metabolism. So our future research directions involve studying the mechanisms by which iron and erythropoietin may affect FGF23 production and metabolism, which could possibly impact the cardiovascular health of our pediatric CKD patients. I'd like to thank the K-12 program, the Department of Pediatrics, the Division of Pediatric Nephrology, and the Center for Iron Disorders. Thank you. Okay. That was a great job, Art. Okay, the next speaker is Carolina Co. Carolina is a uh, clinical instructor in the Division of Allergy, Immunology, and Rheumatology, uh, and her mentor is Don Cohn. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my work with you today um, on targeted gene therapy and the treatment of X-linked hyper IgM syndrome. Uh, the hyperimmunoglobulin M syndromes are a heterogeneous group of genetic disorders resulting in defects of immunoglobulin class switch recombination with, a, with or without defects of somatic hypermutation. So in order for a B cell to produce class switch immunoglobulin, it needs to interact with a T cell through various receptors. An absolute requirement is between CD40, which is constitutively expressed on B cells, and CD40 ligand, which is tightly regulated and expressed only upon immune activation. Defects in CD40 ligand are what account for the X-linked form of disease, and these patients present with a combined immunodeficiency. Despite supportive care with supplemental immunoglobulin and prophylactic antibiotics, um, outcomes for these patients remains relatively poor with 20% survival at 25 years of age. Um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant is the only cure to date. Um, however, it is um, associated with multiple complications and, in a, and is not an option for patients who do not have an HLA match. Um, for this reason, various groups have tried um, looking at the role of gene therapy um, for this disease using mouse models. Um, in both, they were able to successfully transfer normal murine CD40 ligand cDNA using a retroviral vector. However, um, a large percentage of the mice in both studies developed abnormal lymphoproliferation, likely due to um, dysregulated expression of CD40 ligand. 
So knowing that the CD40 ligand gene is t tightly regulated and requires um, expression in its normal chromosomal context, we hypothesize that site-specific gene modification of the CD40 ligand gene in human hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells will correct XHIM by autologous transplantation. And this can be done using site-specific endonucleases, which target specific DNA sequences for gene modification and ultimately allow physiologic expression of the corrected endogenous CD40 ligand gene. So the overall schema would be to create uh, engineer nucleases, and the ones that we've chosen are talons and the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which has gained a lot of attention in recent years. These engineered endonucleases can create double-stranded breaks that are targeted. These double-stranded breaks can be repaired either through non-homologous end joining, which is error-prone, or if you utilize the sequence surrounding the cut site as homology arms to flank normal human CD40 ligand cDNA, you could allow the cell to undergo homology-directed repair using this template integrate this normal cDNA cassette, and allow expression of the gene under control of the endogenous CD40 ligand promoter. And so we've um, been treating primary CD4 T cells derived from XHIM patients using talons um, to induce a double-stranded break and a cDNA donor cassette um, that is introduced by AAV transduction. And, and as you can see um, on the top, cells that um, untreated XHIM T cells that do not um, receive any of these uh, reagents do not express CD40 ligand, which is shown on the X axis. And then cells that receive only talon also do not, receive, do not express CD40 ligand. However, when um, patient cells are treated with both the talon and this corrective donor, you can see that cells on the left that are at rest express around 7% CD40 ligand, and this increases with immune stimulation using CD3, CD28. And then you can see this is just a summary of multiple experiments demonstrating consistent results. We've also used the same um, experimental setup but using CRISPR-Cas9, and on the top are our control samples showing no CD40 ligand expression uh, when cells are treated with just the CRISPR, whether or not they're stimulated. And below, we see a very similar pattern of a, of a lower expression without stimulation and upregulation with CD3 and 28. And then over multiple experience, uh, experiments, we also see very similar um, results. What's also been very nice is that we see that these gene-modified patient T cells respond physiologically to re-stimulation. And so when we carry these same cells in culture um, through multiple weeks, we can see that um, CD40 ligand expression comes to rest, which is the light blue dots, and then they upregulate with immune stimulation. We see similar results with the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And then we've also been able to correlate these flow cytometric results molecularly with digital droplet PCR using primers and probes that are specific for this inserted um, cDNA cassette. And what's been very nice is that we can show that the flow results and the digital droplet PCR results correlate almost exactly. And what this has allowed us to do is to take these experiments into normal CD34 cells, since we don't have patient CD34s, and we've been able to assess for targeted gene integration using digital droplet. And using talons or CRISPRs with this AAV donor, we can achieve up to 20, 25% gene modification. And so in summary, we've been able to achieve targeted gene modification at the CD40 ligand locus in cell lines, primary XHIM T cells and primary hematopoietic stem cells. Um, corrected XHIM T cells respond physiologically to immune stimuli. Um, and then future directions include differentiating these cells, um, treated CD34 cells and NSG mice, and artificial thymic organoids in collaboration with uh, Dr. Crooks. And then the long-term goals are to bring this to clinic. Um, and so, of course, thank you to my mentor, Dr. Cohn, all the smart people I work with, and, and my funding um, by the K-12 and the PITTC. So thank you. <clears throat> okay, good. Uh, the, the last speaker is Joanna Jill. Joanna is a fellow in Hemonc and will become a clinical instructor uh, in J July. And her mentor is Amanda Clark. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I'm just going to be doing a brief overview of my project as I just started the K-12 a few months ago. But the title of my project is Interrogating the Role of PRDM14 in Human Germ Cell Development and Germ Cell Tumors. 
So just a little background on germ cell tumors. Um, they actually encompass a more heterogeneous group of germ of uh, tumors that occur both in the gonads and in the extragonadal location. The extragonadal locations are usually along the midline, including in the pineal and supercellular region in the brain, the mediastinum, and the sacrococcygeal. This is felt to be related to malmigration of the germ cells, because if you remember in early development, the germ cells actually migrate from a specific area and then reside in the gonads. And likely, these cells sort of migrated along the midline and fell in incorrect areas and failed to go under apoptosis. The reason why I became interested in germ cell tumors was to look more um, at germ cell tumor biology because there's actually a significant morbidity that goes along with treatment of germ cell tumors. Overall, there's a pretty good five-year survival rate with about 85 to 90 percent of patients surviving. However, if you have higher stage at diagnosis or, or fail to respond to cisplatin therapy, you have poor outcome. Cisplatin therapy is the baseline of therapy, and over the last three or four decades, it's actually been pretty stagnant in your treatment where bleomycin, atoposide, or cisplatin, or BEP is your standard regimen, and we've varied. We haven't varied from that regimen um, since starting that in the 70s. Um, as you can see from this figure on the right, these are all the areas that you can have morbidities from treatment with germ cell tumors. And so with that rationale, with having poor outcome if you don't respond to cisplatin therapy, and if you respond having lots of comorbidities from your therapy, um, the thought is we should find um, better therapies um, available for treatment of germ cell tumors. So just a little bit of background on where do germ cell tumors come from. They're thought to originate from a very early precursor cell, the primordial germ cell, which is the earliest forms of the mammalian germ cell. They arise from the subset of cells in the inner cell mass and have lots of properties that are very similar to embryonic stem cells. And in fact, in vitro, primordial germ cells have the ability to be reprogrammed into a pluripotent stem cell. One of the key players identified in reprogramming is pyridium-14. Pyridium-14 is a transcription factor that's normally only found in embryonic stem cells of the inner cell mass and then only in primordial germ cells and turns off before birth and is not found in any adult somatic cells except for of recently cells, um, cancers have been shown to aberrantly express pyridium-14 including germ cell tumors. Given this, I hypothesized that pyridium-14 fun functions to promote germline reprogramming from a committed germ cell into a stem cell-like cell with multiple flates, including the formation of germ cell tumors. There are uh, models of germ cell tumors that are available in mouse models. However, these mouse models don't exactly replicate what we see in human germ cell tumors. These mouse models are more representative of the teratomas, which are the benign tumors that we see in the human germ cell tumors. As well, as I said, um, germ cells develop very early on in human development, around two to three weeks of life. So the ability to obtain in vivo germ cells is very difficult to study. Given that, um, our lab works on a human stem cell model of germ cells. So using either pluripotent stem cell that either comes from a reprogram somatic cell or human embryonic stem cells, we have um, developed the ability to turn these pluripotent stem cells into germ cells and then use them to study various diseases such as infertility and in my case, germ cell tumor development. So the model that I propose for my project with the K12 is to generate a platform for human germ cell tumor models using these pluripotent stem cells that I then transform into these primordial germ cell-like cells, at which point I'll ectopically express pyridium-14 to both evaluate the development of the germline with overexpression of pyridium-14 as it's normally repressed during development, as well as evaluate its tumorigenicity by looking at survival proliferation and hopefully looking at its ability to form tumors when injected into skin mice. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the Clark Lab, my SOC committee, and as well as the K-12 funding. Thanks, Joanna. Can I just turn the slide off? All right. Are they doing? Okay. I'm very pleased to introduce Susan Bookheimer as an Oh, you're here. Oh, okay. As a senior scientist and scholar who's going to kind of bookend our senior uh, talks with the junior faculty talks. So Susan holds the Joaquin Fuster Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience. She's a professor in multiple departments, Psychiatry, Behavioral Science, and the Department of Psychology. She's director of the Stagnan Center for, the Cog for Cognitive Neuroscience and the Center for Translational Research in Neurodevelopment. 
She trained in Cornell, Wayne State, did a fellowship at NIH, and then found her way to UCLA in 1993. She's a clinical neuropsychologist. Her work has spanned both basic science and all the way up to clinical and maybe even health services research. Clinically, she, um, she does fMRI work on pre-surgical patients, and her work is mostly on brain imaging, and she has studied normal brain, intellectual impairment, and I think cognitively advanced brain development. So today's talk is on brain behavior and development translational research in the UCLA IDDRC. So welcome, Susan. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I am uh, very grateful for the invitation. Um, I'm going to, within this theme, talk about translational research in the UCLA uh, IDDRC just mentioned. First, I have no disclosures. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about three general things. First, um, most broadly, introduce our model that we have in our center on translational research in developmental disorders and um, introduce you to some of the resources and programs that we have in the IDDRC that are open to anybody on campus who is interested in developmental disorders. And so I hope that some of you will avail yourselves of these opportunities. And, um, and then I'm going to spend the bulk of the talk talking about translational work in autism spectrum uh, disorders um, from a range of perspectives. Um, so in a broad way, um, we espouse an interactive model of translational research. And by that, I mean that rather than considering translational research something that starts at a very basic level like genetics and goes up to the clinic in a linear fashion, we think of this as more of an interactive model in which um, uh, we have crosstalk between the geneticists, between the um, animal models, between the people who are doing human research, um, and hopefully with, um, with the clinicians who are seeing the patients and also with outreach groups, including patient advocacy groups. And I think that it's extremely important that we all learn how to talk to one another in some kind of a shared language. Um, and so one of the endeavors that we're embarking on is a communications program to try to get, for example, our um, cellular and molecular scientists to learn how to communicate to parent groups, uh, which turns out to be rather difficult. Um, but it's essential because it's very hard to, to, um, to try to convince people to support, particularly parent groups and advocacy groups, to support basic science if they have no idea what we're uh, talking about. And I think we have very much to learn from one another. Um, so we've been focusing on developing translational biomarkers, biomarkers that are valid in both human and animal models that take advantage of the genetic um, stuff that we've been learning first through identification in the clinic and then in animal models and using them to test the efficacy of different kinds of treatments. Um, and I'll use an example of that in a little bit. But first, just to introduce you um, uh, a bit to the IDDRC, uh, which is, by the way, the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center. It took me about three years to learn how to say IDDRC that quickly. That's, that's really true. Um, we are studying a variety of, of uh, uh, disorders and conditions. I've li listed some of them here. I think autism is the one we study the most, but we have a, a big program in epilepsy, brain tumors, Down syndrome, uh, a large program in pediatric brain injury, um, uh, some rare single uh, gene disorders and uh, de novo mutations, neuropsychiatric disorders. And uh, we try to study as many of these disorders as possible um, from multiple levels of understanding, so levels of analysis from genes all the way through systems. I'll show you some examples of that. Um, but also to think about different research paths from basic science through education uh, and outreach. So in our center now, which used to be just a basic neuro uh, neurobiology group, we now have clinicians, we have um, outreach people, we have uh, um, uh, community advocates, um, as well as um, uh, geneticists and uh, molecular biologists and, of course, people like myself who do human imaging uh, research. Uh, this is our um, IDDRC core structure. This is funded by an a NICHD grant. Um, I, I can't, I'm not going to go through the whole slide with you, but I'd just like to point out a couple of core resources that might be of interest to you. Um, the first one is that in the administrative core um, that I direct, we have an education and outreach program, and the communications program is, is part of that. And I, as we develop that further, I hope that some of you, particularly those of you who are doing basic science, will participate in that. Um, but maybe you'd be more interested in the fact that we provide vouchers um, for people who want to get um, to embark on some new research projects and want to utilize some of the core resources. And you don't, if you don't have any grant money yet to do that, we provide some, um, uh, some seed funding to help you do that. And among the, the, um, the we, have, 
we have four active cores and each of them performs many services at multiple levels. So for example, we have a genetics and genomics core that will do sequencing, gene expression, epigenetics, um, and also a lot of informatics for, um, for storage of data and um, for some complex genetic analysis. Um, we have a, a cell circuit and systems core, which um, does optogenetics, organoid modeling, electrophysiology in both animals and in humans. Um, the structural and functional visualization core goes from um, basic microscopy all the way up through animal imaging and human MRI imaging. Um, so if you were interested, for example, in doing resting state studies in an animal model, um, we have um, consultants who can help you set up those, uh, those programs for you. Um, and then finally, we have a clinical translation core, and this is um, uh, a new core, and this is the core that is, is um, uh, helping to provide a framework for conducting um, clinical trials, human clinical trials. And so this includes um, uh, clinical trial design, and we have some excellent folks who, who do some complex clinical uh, trial designs, um, uh, expertise in recruitment. Um, in the informatics that are necessary for running a really good clinical trial. Um, for example, they'll do automatic randomization and things like that. Um, biostat support, and most importantly, um, extensive cognitive and behavioral phenotyping through our uh, neurodevelopmental clinic. Um, uh, we'll also collect biospecimens uh, and um, uh, do you know, testing of biomarkers. So it's, it's a very, very broad program that has facilities for um, doing research at, at many, many different levels. And um, we're, uh, although this is housed within the Semmel Institute, um, we have members from multiple departments, and um, we really are, are trying to develop this program into a university-wide program, so we're very interested in forming collaborations with pediatrics, psychiatry, neurology, neurosurgery, um, in basic medicine, and, um, and, in, and, just in, in, and public health, and enhancing those interactions so that we can really go through the whole range of uh, the research types and you know, from basic science all the way through community outreach. Uh, we've developed a partnership with the Tarjan Center, which is a, a um, uh, uh, the, the center that it's, it's a university center of excellence in developmental disabilities that works with people and, and in the community that provides another conduit for um, not just for outreach but also not and not just providing services for them but potentially for um, getting human subjects for example into our research projects we think that that's a, an important circle to develop so that said I'm going to go through an example of this approach um, in um, talking about some of our studies in autism through the Autism Center of uh, Excellence that we have at UCLA um, and um, I'll talk about um, I think each of these levels that I've mentioned earlier gene identification gene expression um, animal models common variation in humans and how we can examine that using human brain imaging um, developing animal models of intervention as well as human interventions, behavioral phenotyping, and the development of translational biomarkers um, within this sort of autism. And I'd like to think that this is a model that can be used for a range of um, developmental disorders, not just affecting the brain, but uh, other systems as well, even though we're brain, obviously, brain-oriented people. Um, I'd like to start with this uh, really nice um, slide from a uh, study that Dan Gashwin and Brett Abrams did a few years ago on um, looking at candidate genes for autism uh, from Nature Reviews Genetics. And um, it's, it's actually already out of date. I think we've probably got 200 more risk genes since 2008. But, um, but what is interesting about this is, is what they did was they pulled out all the candidate genes that had been developed, that, that had been demonstrated in various studies from, uh, in autism and ranked them on the, um, the amount of evidence that was available um, for, um, uh, for each of these genes as being a good autism risk gene. And one of the things I like to point out in, um, in examining these genes is that when you look at those most highly ranked genes, like the ones you see on the bottom here, they share, many of them share the same pathways. In fact, there are only a couple of pathways, four, maybe four or five pathways at the most um, that are involved in these high risk genes. Um, and they're, they just are, are hits at various points along those same pathways. And, and these genes tend to be involved in cell signaling, cell adhesion, synaptogenesis, neural migration, dendritic growth, basically everything, all the processes that are involved in fetal brain development, and in particular in, in forming connections. And that's really going to be the theme of, of what we've learned so far in autism is that it's a, a disorder of developmental disconnectivity. Um, this is a gene expression study that was done by um, uh, Neil Parikshak and Dan Gashwin's lab. Um, what he did was he, he took um, 
a um, uh, this uh, uh, a database that was already available that had that was um, that had data from several of the large scale autism genetic studies and looked at RNA seq to look at um, co expression network analysis. So basically, he looked at genes that were in time co that were co expressed in the brain and looked at their developmental trajectories. And what he found was this series of modules that are all um, numbered M one through M I think seventeen. Um, and what he found was that three of these modules, and only three of these modules, were very densely represented in, um, in the samples uh, that have been collected for um, uh, high-risk genes in autism from Safari and uh, a couple of others. I just want to point out a couple of things uh, uh, about this. And one is that, um, that these modules are specific to autism. They're not general to intellectual disability, even though intellectual disability often accompanies autism. So I think that was really a, a very important finding um, that the genes for autism are not necessarily those uh, that are related to uh, intellectual disability per se. And if you look at just one of these modules, this is module 13, um, we see within it some of the genes that, um, that we've seen many times in our autism studies. I'm going to point out catnap1 in the middle there um, because I'm going to be talking about that um, in just a minute. What's also interesting, if you look at the, um, the, the, uh, the time frame of the expression of these gene modules, this is a sample of, of six gene modules, and um, these three are the three main modules that were found enriched in autism. And the red line shows birth. So um, uh, if you look at the developmental trajectories, you can see that these genes that are associated with autism are expressed beginning prior to birth and increasingly very shortly after birth. And that's very important because autism is something that is typically not diagnosed till a couple of years of, of age. And there are many people who are still saying out there that um, there are no signs of autism before about two years of age and that it can't be re reliably diagnosed until about three years of age. We, don't, we believe that's not true. And I'll show you some data um, um, suggesting that that's not true. This at least suggests that the path that leads one to autism begins before birth and, and starts to be manifest uh, immediately after birth. Um, so I'll show you some, um, some animal research from, um, this is from Josh Trachtenberg's lab. He's in the uh, Department of Neurobiology here. In one of the, um, the knockout model, mouse models of, um, of autism, this is a P10 knockout. Um, and um, I just wanted to show you a method slide first. Um, these are these miniaturized cameras that are implanted. So he's got a little hole in the skull there that you can see. This mini miniaturized camera is put right over the cortex. And then you can shine a light through it and um, look at um, dendritic development in the cortex in real time. So these are awake behaving, running around animals. Um, and and he's, he's, he's watching development. Um, we can do calcium imaging of those same um, uh, animals. This is um, work that's being done currently by Payman Golshani in our group, and uh, and look at the um, at uh, uh, real time um, activation of um, of neurons. Um, I'm going to show you some data on the actual development in this um, uh, model. There we go. Uh, so uh, on the um, uh, the we, we have the knockouts um, on the left and above, and then the um, uh, controls on the on the lower right, and so the uh, the difference images in the center are um, those are the average growth trajectories in the uh, knockout above and in the control below, and what I think you can see is interesting here. I don't know. If, oh yeah, the yellow turns out pretty well. Is is that you can see that there is dendritic overgrowth in this model, but you can also see that it's restricted to the apical dendrites. Um, and not to the basal dendrites. To my eye, the basal dendrites look a little disorganized in the knockout model, um, but at least the length is about the same. And so what it suggests is that there is an effect on connectivity, on the development of, of dendritic growth and connectivity in this animal model, um, but it's a, it's a very specific um, kind of uh, connectivity deficit. And I'm, I'm emphasizing that because I'm going to show you now some, uh, some human studies um, showing the same thing. Um, so um, in, in these series of studies, what we are trying to do is to integrate um, what we know from the genetics of autism with what we can demonstrate in human um, studies of children with autism in vivo, and so living, breathing, talking, walking children. Um, so one of the risk genes that I showed you before was the CNT-NEP2, which we affectionately call catnap. Um, 
Uh, this is a risk gene for autism. It's um, actually associated with language deficits in particular, and it's not specific to autism. It's also seen in, um, in developmental language uh, d delays um, and a selective uh, language impairment. So um, in Dan's group, um, Brett Abrams did uh, a, um, a gene expression study in fetal brain, and what he found was this catnap2, the protein associated with this gene, is expressed in a few areas of the brain that were very critical, um, the amygdala, the, um, the basal ganglia, and frontal cortex. We were very interested in this because, as you can see on the right, this is a um, functional MRI study that we did um, and that was done by my student who's down featured below, Ashley Scott Van Zeeland of language development um, and language activation in uh, children with autism and typically developing children. And this is a difference map. This map shows areas of the brain that are more active in typically developing children in an artificial language learning task in comparison to um, that same uh, task in children with autism. And these are IQ matched children. So these are, are, are high functioning kids with autism. And what we were struck by was the, um, the extent of the overlap in the areas that we saw impaired in functional imaging in children with autism with the gene expression patterns in catnap. So there's a way that we can study this. We call this a general approach imaging genetics. Um, I'm going to first show you a, a, a new task that we developed, and then I'll show you how we analyze the data um, to look at functional connectivity and its relation to a, to a gene. So this is an implicit learning task, a social reward task. This is what we do when we do functional MRI. We put somebody in the scanner, we scan their brains um, with very, very rapid imaging, and we have the children perform a task. And in this case, they see these random designs, like you see the psychedelic um, little circle there, and they're told to associate each of these um, designs with a number, one or two. And from the children's perspective, it, it actually seems quite random, and there's a, a good reason for that because it's only um, the association is not 100 percent; it's only about 66 percent. So if you try to guess that this purple shape goes with number one, you'll be right about 66 percent of the time and wrong 34 percent of the time. And people can't learn that very well when there are when, when there are enough of these stimuli, so they end up just guessing. But the brain apparently learns this information, um, the probabilistic information anyway. And this, and we can look at those brain responses. So even when the children are completely unaware of there actually being an association, a probabilistic association between, these two, between a stimulus and a number, the brain does know it. It calculates these statistical probabilities. And so we give them rewards. So this is a social reward. They either get um, a smiling face of one of our very attractive former graduate students, um, or if they're wrong, they get the pouty face. And um, it's, it's surprising how powerful a stimulus this is, a rewarding stimulus this is. You might think, you know, well, jaded, you, you know, Los Angeles teens, right? This can't possibly be rewarding. Um, but it, it really is. Um, on the left, we show the ventral striatum, um, which is our primary reward center in the brain. And these are typical children responding to smiling faces. And they get this massive um, uh, increase in activity when they see those smiling faces compared to a control condition. And if you compare that with the kids with autism, you can see that there's a very large difference. So um, the, um, the socially reinforced implicit learning turns out to be very impaired in individuals with, with autism, even when they're masked, matched for IQ, and even when the learning itself is completely implicit, which I think is interesting. Now. We can do a functional connectivity analysis, and this starts to get at um, uh, the work that I showed you in animals, how do things connect in the brain? So um, I'm just going to show you what we mean by functional connectivity in, um, uh, in, in, um, in vivo brain imaging. So in functional connectivity analysis, we grab a region of interest from the brain, a seed, and from in this case, it's a seed that turned out to be one of those uh, seeds that differentiated the typically developing from a, um, a autism population. And we looked at this, the time series, so we're collecting data over a period of five or six minutes, and there are random fluctuations in this area of the brain. And then we query. Um, all of the other areas of the brain that have the same time series. So basically what we're, what we're looking for is if this area of the brain has a certain random fluctuation in its activity, what other brains are fluctuating in concert with it? And to the extent to which two areas of the brain, even if they're quite far apart, are moving at the, at the exact same way and at the exact same time, then we consider them to be functionally connected. And so we can develop these maps then of functional connectivity. 
And what we found um, in this study and what we did here was we, we had a mixed group of children with uh, autism and um, typically developing children. And then we did a, uh, a cross-validation on just healthy children who did or did not carry the catnap autism risk gene. So now we're not looking at differences between autism and controls. We're looking at the difference between carriers of an autism risk gene and non-carriers of the same risk gene. And what we found was this um, interesting double dissociation where there was um, increased local connectivity, so nearby connectivity with our seed region among kids with autism, but decreased long-range connectivity. And if you'll recall back to the animal uh, literature that I showed you, that's pretty much the, the same thing that they found in the animal model. Um, there are other ways that we can look at this, and we are looking at a variety of genes, but I'm going to show you the second um, gene, which is the oxytocin uh, receptor gene. There are, so oxytocin receptor gene has been implicated in autism. There are a number of SNPs that have been identified as autism risk SNPs. Um, and um, oxytocin, as you probably know, is a very important um, hormone. It's involved in social um, uh, bonding in, um, in animal models. And... Um, we know a fair amount about how it, uh, it, where it's expressed in the brain, particularly in the ventral striatum, but also in some other areas. And in particular, we're interested in this network called the salience network. The salience network is a network of brain regions with a hub in the anterior insula that is involved in marking um, what is important in the environment. So directing your attention to that which is salient and meaningful and away from things that are irrelevant. Um, we believe that this is an important network in autism. And so what we do in this kind of analysis is to choose a seed in the hub center of this network, which is in the anterior insula, and then you ask the question, what other areas of the brain are highly connected with this seed region um, functionally, so during a functional um, activation task, or in this case, just at rest? And so these are, um, this is one of the risk SNPs uh, on the autism, on the um, oxytocin receptor. And these are the functional connectivity patterns. So basically the more yellow you see, the greater connectivity with the salient seed. So the non-risk carriers are at the top. The moderate um, and, um, uh, and double risk carriers and intermediate carriers and, and uh, uh, homozygous carriers are in the middle. And the bottom represents the difference between the non-risk carriers and the risk carriers. And I think what you can see is that there is um, long range connectivity increases in the non-risk carriers compared to the risk carriers. What this is telling us again is that those who are carrying an autism risk gene, and this is true for both, um, well, I'll, I'll show you some more data on that, but um, that the non-risk carriers have greater functional connectivity throughout the salience region. So they're better able to mark out what is salient and connect different areas of the brain that are involved in integrating information about what's important in the environment. Um, uh, we are able to um, pull data from many different sites now um, who've collected data uh, information like this, resting state connectivity data. And this is a um, study that we participated in um, where uh, centers across the world um, donated their autism and control data in resting state MRI and asked the question, how do children with autism and typically developing um, uh, controls differ in their functional connectivity? So the blue represents areas in which children with, um, who are typically developing have more connectivity in the brain than kids with autism. And you can see that there is massively more connectivity among the typically developing kids. And if you look at the uh, at the key below, um, that's connectivity in cortico-cortical connections and heteromodal um, uh, cortex. Below, we see the very few regions where connectivity is greater in the kids with autism. And that connectivity is greater between primary sensory and primary motor cortex and other areas of the brain. And we believe, and we're, we're working on a model um, suggesting that these kids are so focused on their internal sensory states that they don't direct their what, what is important attentionally to the external environment, that um, their attention is directed inwards to their discomfort and their, their sensory over arousal, their anxiety over arousal, and just their, their internal states. So, um, 
Now, the studies that I've shown you so far have been studies in children with autism in the 7 to 14, 15 state, uh, uh, age range. But um, what we'd really like to do is to develop biomarkers um, that are seen early in life. And I mentioned before that we believe that, um, that changes associated, brain changes associated with autism began very early in life. So we began a program, this is my uh, close colleague, Marilla DePreto, in um, scanning infants who are at high risk for autism by virtue of having a sibling with autism and also another family member on the autism spectrum. Uh, these children um, have a chance, if they're boys, they have a chance of getting autism in the 40% range. So just to um, give you a clue, that's a, that's a really a very high risk for developing autism. And so they're scanned during natural sleep. So here's a picture of a baby just shoved into a, a scanner with a special little ear pads on to cover up so that they don't um, get their hearing hurt. And um, they come in at night and their moms bring them in and try to put them to sleep. So um, I mentioned the salience network earlier. Um, you may be uh, surprised to hear that infants, these are six week old infants, have um, salience networks already intact. So a six week infant can already, already has a built in network to tell what's important and what's not. Um, so uh, these are areas um, showing where the high risk kids, so kids who have um, a dense family history of autism, show greater connectivity at top and where they show less connectivity at bottom. And at six weeks of age, we show greater connectivity um, in somatosensory cortex among children with autism, six weeks of age, um, and um, less connectivity or more connectivity for the control children in these more distant uh, brain regions that are part of the salience network, in fact, and, and are, are very much associated with paying attention to the external world. So I think it's remarkable um, that we can see brain changes, functional brain changes at six weeks of age in autism when people are still out there saying we can't diagnose autism reliably until they're um, uh, three years of age. So we're, we are confident that if we keep developing these kinds of biomarkers, we'll be able um, to, uh, to identify children who are um, at risk and, and try to intervene early. And in fact, our, our, um, our uh, Autism Center of Excellence grant right now is pulling these children out at 12 months of age if they start to show any kinds of, of um, alterations from a typical trajectory and put them into a treatment program that's a preventative treatment program with the idea that they may never develop autism if we can intervene early enough. And that's our, our ultimate goal. Um, so um, that was a, I just showed you a resting state um, functional MRI. Um, we also can do activation um, of speech, natural speech um, uh, in sleeping infants. We just play them either their native language, English, or a language they've never heard before, um, Japanese, while they're sleeping. And um, lo and behold, the brain has already learned how to process one's natural sleep when babies are born. Um, of course, they've been listening to their own natural language um, all the way through their um, uh, prenatal development, but this is six weeks of, of, um, of birth exposure to real natural language. The low-risk children are uh, above, and the purple areas are the areas of overlap, but what we're interested in is the areas that are, are different, that show a difference between the response to their native language and the response to a novel language they've never heard before, in this case, Japanese. And those are the areas that you see in blue. So those blue areas are areas where they are directing more attention and they show more activity in response to this um, strange language that they've never heard before. This is at six weeks of age. Below, we see the high-risk infants, and you will see that they don't show those same areas of blue. They don't distinguish between the two languages. And so this tells us that there's a great deal happening, not just in, in the um, intrinsic connectivity architecture of the brain in infants, but also in how that architecture is working during language processing, six weeks of age. Um, we are also conducting a variety of treatment trials um, and animal models of intervention and early invention with um, joint attention symbolic play, which I'm going to show you in a second, as well as medication trials for minim minimally verbal children. Um, and our goal is to relate animal findings to human findings to try to find, again, these translational mechanisms that we can test our hypotheses first in, in animals, develop our treatments, and then do them in humans. So oxytocin is, of course, one of these things we're interested in. Um, we've, uh, I already showed you some... Um, 
uh, data on oxytocin. There are ongoing studies looking at administering nasal spray oxytocin to children with autism. Some parents are just doing this on their own. And, um, and nasal spraying of oxytocin does change activity in the reward centers in normal adults. We know that thus far, there are some preliminary trials going on in kids with autism, more to follow. But I wanted to show you the um, animal model. So this is a um, wild type mouse, and you can see how they, how they um, are doing with each other. This is what mice do, they sniff. They sniff their butts, that's what they do. <laughs> okay. All right, and now I'm gonna show you a knockout model of the catnap gene. And that's the gene I showed you before in our human studies. Okay, this is the catnap uh, model. See, there's catnap mice. It doesn't take much to show two things. First of all, they don't really care much about each other. And second, um, this guy's got a little bit of motor deficit there. Do you see his like splaying feet? Okay, and now what we've done is we've treated one of these pairs of, of mice with oxytocin. Anybody want to guess which mice have been treated with oxytocin? So these are all knockout mice. Okay, yeah, it's pretty obvious, right? The guys on the, on the left have been treated with oxytocin, same knockout, and the guys on the right have not. So it suggests to us that, that we can, in fact, look at treatments in animals, in these animal models, and then hopefully try to apply this to, um, uh, to human clinical trials. And... Uh, um, now, we also um, are doing behavioral interventions that are uh, closely tied to the early markers that we have been um, developing over the years in autism, um, with one of the earliest markers being a failure of joint attention, so the failure to, or, or a deficit in initiating um, with another person the uh, an attention towards a shared something uh, of importance in the environment, where like if I hold up a toy, I look at it, I look at my kid, the kid looks at the toy, we both look at the toy together. We are engaged in joint attention. So Connie Cassery um, has been working for years to develop um, these uh, treatment programs. Um, and this one is called Jasper. And uh, in our new grant, we're using a version of this called Baby Jasper. And these are this is an intervention that we're conducting with the 12-month-old kids prior to diagnosis of autism at the first sign of maybe some kind of, of delay that might be associated with autism. And I'm gonna show you some videos of that, There's a, here's a young kid um, entry into the program. This is his mom, so this is a parent training program. Yeah, the triangle. He's obviously a smart kid. Very good. He's not looking at his mom. He's basically nonverbal. Yeah, he's got a word here and there, but he's not talking with her and he's not interacting with her. It might not be obvious to you that this child has autism, um, but this is what we look for. And um, uh, and if you know what you're looking for. Uh, in joint attention, then you can you can start to, to pick up these subtle signs. Because when you see a kid that's that bright, he's just going ahead and putting these blocks in their holes, you think, well, they must be fine, because look how smart he is. Not the case. Here's this kid after, um, I believe it's two months of treatment. Yeah. Very good. That was good. You looked so nicely at me. Circle. Circle. Good showing. Do. Oval. <laughs> yeah, oval. 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 Good showing. Wow. So you can see how nicely his, um, his language has improved in that short period of time. Um, just by focusing on what we believe are those primary deficits that we see at the earliest stage of developments that might start differentiating these kids. Um, and I hope that that um, convinces you that intervention, even behavioral interventions, can be effective. Obviously, we want to develop more interventions. We're working primarily on combining now um, medication interventions with behavioral interventions because we think that medication is never going to work in isolation. It's only going to work when it's put in the context of a learning paradigm that is relevant for social uh, development. Um, so I hope that I've convinced you that taking this kind of translational approach um, will be able to help us in the future develop um, metrics and biomarkers for identifying um, children who are um, heading off a, a normal developmental trajectory very early. And by, by using this integrative approach, um, we'll be able to develop uh, successful interventions that we hope will prevent um, the development of the more severe forms of autism that so many of these kids will end up with. So with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues and thank you all for your attention. That was, that was fabulous. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking, you're studying autism here, but there's a potential analogy to children who are emotionally deprived yep. or grow up in impoverished 
backgrounds. We've all heard about the, the millions of words that kids who are in high educated families hear versus, versus ones in low educated, but a similar analogy may hold. Absolutely. In fact, uh, we do have some studies that are going on now with Adriana Galvan in um, psychology and also in, um, we have a new postdoc who's working comparing kids who, are de who come from deprived um, childhoods uh, with um, mostly kids who are, who are brought up in the foster care system with um, uh, children with autism because they share some features, for example, of the sensory abnormalities. And so trying to understand that whole pathogenesis is extremely important. That's great. We have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. So my question to you is oh, there's, there's a mic coming. <clears throat> Thank you. I said it was a wonderful talk, as always. Um, the, this, what you described as a dysfunction of the local connections or you know, the differences between local versus long range, is that pathognomonic of autism alone, or can you see it in other disorders? Or does, for example, I'm just going to bring up dyslexia, it has been described to have the opposite. So I just wondered what your thoughts were and how diagnostic could that be of a particular disorder? Yeah, so, um, so uh, I believe that the early, uh, the, um, the early approaches to this tried to develop sort of global um, explanations. There is over overgrowth of local connections, undergrowth of long-range connections. I think that what we've been learning over the last few years is that they are pathway-specific and that, the, that many disorders, I suspect that all developmental disorders, frankly, are ultimately going to be found to be some kind of disorder of, of, um, of connectivity. But where and how is, is the question. So I think that if you've got a, 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 um, a deficit or an abnormality in connectivity in which you've got very strong connectivity with sensory cortex and very poor connectivity with attentional systems that direct your attentional uh, externally, that's that's a that's a, a paradigm for autism, but you could also have a, disconnectivities in other systems altogether, and you would predict to have other disorders. And even within the realm of autism, which is what we're looking at now, autism is a very heterogeneous disorder, and kids have different primary features. Some kids have like major problems with re repetitive behaviors. Others are very sensory, um, uh, overstimulated. Others are very anxious. Others are very hyperactive. And so we would predict then that the specific pathways that are uh, connected abnormally will relate to the, ultimately relate to the, to the phenotype. And so I think it holds true within uh, the disorder of autism, but also across the, the range of, of developmental disorders. Uh, we are actually putting out a grant right now comparing um, OCD, anxiety, see if I can get them all, OCD, anxiety, ADHD, autism, um, looking at the same kind of thing to see what we're, if we can understand what is overlapping and what is um, uh, disorder specific. There's a question over there. Other questions? Right. Yes. I, oh, I uh, was really amazed at looking at the MRIs in the six week old. Yeah. And I was wondering, um, with the language, you said the foreign the language that they are not accustomed to and English. And I was wondering what the response would be for like a white noise or music, you know, as music is being related to neurodevelopment so much with Mozart and all that. So I was wondering if you have any information. Yeah, that's it's interesting. I mean, there are a lot of things that we could look at, too. We have uh, other paradigms that are just focused on um, completely novel stimuli to look at the response to statistical regularities to see about just learning. Um, but we haven't looked at music or other things yet, just, you know, there are only so much, only so much we can do at one time in autism. It would certainly be interesting to think about music. You know, a lot of kids are exposed to music in, a, in utero, as, as you know. So I don't know. We, you know we'd have, we'll have to, have to wait and see. Hold on, Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, there was some recent data also suggesting that the the gut brain access might be involved with this, and that I know there were some animal models that when they actually had the nobotic mice who had this type of I guess it's maternal trauma syndrome, and they have autistic appearing um, children offspring, and they replaced the microbiome with certain um, bacteria that they change their autistic behavior. I, I didn't know if you can comment how this 
would play a role in what your other hypothesis are. Yeah, more. so we're not sure about what the, exactly the mechanism of the connection, but Pat Levitt over at uh, USC is is actually focusing on um, uh, what he's got a grant called Tummy Troubles um, in Autism. Um, there, there clearly is a relationship. We've done some preliminary work with our phenotyping data to look at the extent to which digestive complaints correlate with autism symptoms, and, and they do. We, we have found that kids who've got more digestive problems, and sometimes it's constipation, and sometimes it's just irritation, um, tend to have more serious language problems. We don't know if it's sort of a global severity thing or if there is a specific mechanism yet. Um, as to intervention, again, it's really not, cl you know, we don't know exactly why, but I think that um, in a, 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 perhaps a simplistic model, and it's only a hypothesis, but it's one that at least the imaging data suggests is, is true. If you are very, if you've got digestive problems and you are very, it's pretty hard to focus on something else when you've got digestive problems. If you know, any of you were, had really bad morning sickness like I did, it's like you don't do anything except for like, think about your, how sick you are. And so if you imagine that in the context of, of a developmental model, you know, imagine a, a very young child who's just experiencing a lot of internal strife their attention is going to be focused on that. That's going to be what's salient to them. And it's very hard to switch your attention to external stimuli if your internal stimuli are just dominating the salience picture. So um, is it true that specific gut, pro gut bacteria affect cognition, or is it uh, a byproduct of the upsetness um, affecting attentional allocation? We don't know the answer to that. Um, and you know either are viable hypotheses. Okay, any other questions? There's one back there. Thank you. Uh, I see that uh, the MRI data are mainly color coded, but uh, we, I wonder whether there is any standardization uh, so that you can correlate it with the phenotype. Uh, yeah, the color coding is is um, statistical, um, and in these kind of data, you can correlate. Um, I, mean, I didn't show you any of these data today, but normally, no matter what study we do, we also do a correlation with, for example, symptom severity or language severity, and so you can do the same kind of analysis on a voxel by voxel basis, asking questions like, to what extent does impairment in repetitive behaviors relate to connectivity between these two areas of the brain. So you can do those kinds of analyses. So you don't need to have a standardized color code. The color code is specific to the analysis because it's, a, it's purely a, um, a statistical, it's a number um, of statistical significance. The, um, the raw MRI data are, as, as in all MRI, are measured in arbitrary units of signal intensity, but we've got ways of, of standardizing, normalizing those data so that we can do any kind of analysis that, that we want to. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.